Hey Exodus, Jared here. Really miss hanging out with you guys in the powerhouse and uh, in our life groups. Um, so I'm really excited to be here giving the message today and um, look forward to the time where we all get to see each other once again. So this summer I've been super involved running Camp Lockridge. And as part of our summer camp, we have two Bible studies every week and two chapel services. Um, and in the Bible studies, everybody um, reads a scripture and then discusses it with their kiddos. And in the chapel services, we do some worship, and then we have a big message for everybody. And we've had a lot of different messages. Some actually by the Ignite interns came out for a couple weeks and delivered um, a message on how God lifts us up um, in difficult times. And one of the messages this summer has really stuck with me. And it involves the theme of doubt and temptation and uncertainty and the effect that those things have on our faith. And so I would like to spend today just taking a brief moment to talk about um, how our faith is sufficient, but how doubt can creep in and the effects of doubt, temptation, and uncertainty. So let's start by opening up our Bibles to Matthew 14. I will be reading from the NIV. And so if you want to read along, we're going to be in Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, replied Peter, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. All right, so, very classic story um, that we're all familiar with, where... The boat with the disciples is in a storm. Jesus walks on water. Peter calls out to him. Jesus says, Peter, come to me. Peter begins to walk on the water, fully believing in uh, Jesus' divinity and his power until his human mind steps in and his brain starts going, wait a minute. You're not supposed to walk on water. There's a huge storm going on around us. This doesn't make sense. And at that moment, that tiny bit of human doubt causes Peter to begin to sink in the water until Jesus reaches out and saves him. And as I was thinking about this, and I was reading this, I was thinking, really, the Bible is full of um, stories where humans and their imperfection is on full display. That doubt, that uncertainty, that temptation causes problems. Adam and Eve were told, you have the garden, the garden is perfect, this is where you'll live, and they eat of the tree of the knowledge between good and evil. The Israelites are taken from slavery. They said, God says, I will deliver you to paradise. And they create a golden calf and begin worshiping it. And I'm sure that you can come up with countless other um, examples in the Bible of where God promised something. God was acting and humans doubted them. They had faith in their hearts, but in their minds they begin to have doubt. And as I'm looking at that, and I'm reflecting on that, I think of an egg. Eggs are full of deliciousness. They're fantastic. They're good scrambled. They're good over easy. They're good in an omelet. They make great cakes. But an egg by itself is fragile. It's very easy to crush. This egg represents humans. It represents a Christian. Now, oh, I left it over there. I have a bucket. Hang on. This bucket represents faith. Our faith is limitless. 
our faith has no capacity. We can always improve our relationship with the Lord. We can always become closer to Jesus and grow our faith. And when our cup overfloweth, we are truly happy. We are in a joyful place. Now, if I take this bucket and I place it on top of this egg, and I'm going to hold it just to balance it, it does not crush the egg on its own. So that fragile human underneath is safe. Now, if I take this cup and I fill it with water, that water then represents doubt, temptation, uncertainty. And so as that water gets poured into the bucket, the pressure on that Christian below increases. The faith is still there. It's still sitting above the egg. But the more doubt that gets added to the bucket, the more strain that Christian's under. Until ultimately, the weight becomes too much for that one person to endure, and they end up crushed. Now, the good news of the gospel is that we are not to do this alone. In his ministry, Jesus always went around creating community. He had the 12 disciples. He traveled around to all the different cities and towns um, and areas of um, his, his little corner of the world and was creating community. And so, when we do not go through life on our own, but we join in community with others, the equation changes a little bit. So now, and I'm gonna place this rack on the top of these eggs so I have a flat surface to work with. So now, that all these Christians have come together in community, have come together in one place to support one another, we can take that exact same amount of doubt and everybody's okay. In fact, when people come together, you can continue to add doubt to this collective faith, and it's shared across all the eggs. And so we can continue to add water, and these eggs will not be crushed. In fact, we can continue to add it at such a slow rate with a cup that I'm going to speed it up. So, with all these Christians together, supporting one another, we can really start to add some water before those eggs start to crack. And it sounds like most of them, yep, there it goes. So, we can add a lot more water to this bucket before it begins to crunch these eggs. Now, hang on. Oh. When all these eggs are gathered together into a group, you saw it took three pots of water to get enough for us to crush these eggs. In the same way, when we're gathered together as Christians, in our churches, in our small groups, in Exodus, whatever the case may be, we can have a greater amount of doubt in our collective faiths because we have each other to lean on. So that you can go to somebody else and you can say, hey, I'm struggling with this. Have you ever struggled with it? What did you do? You can go to your youth directors, your pastors, your trusted uh, friends. And that doubt is now no longer just yours to endure. Now, I'm encouraged because we don't just have to do this amongst humans. Jesus died on the cross so that our sins can be forgiven, so that he can carry the burden for us. All we have to do is profess our belief in him. So that now what one egg could not do on its own 
a collection of eggs can do. And I'm also really thankful that the biblical witness does not end with Jesus' death. That it continues, the story continues after he dies. And so I'm specifically going to read from John 20, 24 through 29. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And I love that this episode happens because there are 12 disciples, Jesus has died, and they refuse to be crushed by that information. He appears to them, and they are buoyed, and they continue to believe and begin to spread the word, much like there are 12 eggs and a dozen eggs. But Thomas is that one egg, that first egg that gets crushed by his doubt, by his uncertainty. And even in his far from perfect form, Jesus still pursues him. Thomas doesn't have to have perfect faith for Jesus to say, you matter. That reminds me of another one of our uh, Bible studies for summer camp, the parable of the 99 sheep and the one lost one. When that one sheep goes astray, when it wanders off, when it is given into the temptation of greener grass, the shepherd doesn't say, I have 99 sheep, I'm good. He goes and he pursues that sheep through hills, through valleys. And when he finds him and brings him back, he celebrates. He rejoices with his neighbors. And so these eggs remind me that on our own, just a little bit of doubt, a little bit of temptation can crush us. When we're with a large group of believers, the more people that we encounter in our faith walk and share the good news with them, the stronger we become as a community. The stronger our faith becomes together. And we're able to withstand so much more doubt, temptation, and uncertainty than we can alone. And at the end of the day, it does not matter if we're broken. Because Jesus has overcome brokenness. He died, he was resurrected, he has conquered death and taken away its sting. And so even when we do get to that point where we are no longer perfect, he says that's okay. And he rejoices when we come to him and we say, God, I cannot do this alone. Please help shoulder this burden. Clear my doubt. Bring me into community with you. So that's what I got, guys. Um, I, I encourage you to not be a solo egg. Even in these challenging times, don't be a single egg. Seek out ways that you can fill your 12-pack. Turn that 12-pack into an 18-pack. Turn that 18-pack into two dozen. That two dozen into a gross. Continue to go out. Profess salvation to everybody you meet. Live differently so that they come to you and they say, why are you that way? And when they doubt, when they question, you're able to point to all these other eggs and say, yeah, I know, we got it. Let's close in prayer real quick. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the Bible being full of humans, that we have examples that you do not expect perfection from us. You want a relationship with us, and that, that perfection is yours. You give us strength to endure. And even when you were on earth, you created community. You called the twelve, and you went about building community, building churches. So that nobody had to go through their Christian journey alone. 
I thank you so much that as we gather to worship you in whatever grouping, whatever number it looks like, we get stronger in our faith and our resilience. And that through sharing our journeys together, we come to know you better. I ask that you inspire each one of us to continue to expand the sphere of influence of the Christian church, that we take seriously the prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, so that we can continue to build a community that praises you, that worships you, and that can endure everything that this world throws at us. Because in our hearts we believe, and in our hearts is where you dwell. We ask for your continued protection, your continued strength. Put calmness in our minds and peace in our hearts. And soon we'll be together again, lifting songs up as one body in praise to you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. All right, guys, thanks for hanging out, and uh, maybe go make an omelet for breakfast. Bye, guys.